Good evening to those of you in the UK and buenas tardes to those in Ecuador. We welcome you all to our first ever Galapagos Day webinar. I'm Charmian Keynes, Chair of the Galapagos Conservation Trust. We're delighted to have a truly global audience tonight with us. As of this morning, over 900 people registered from around the world. And we're pleased to have so many of our loyal and trusted GCT supporters and partners, but also so many of you who are new to GCT's events in addition. In the audience this evening, we have a number of highly distinguished guests who I'd like to call out specifically. His Excellency the Ecuadorian Ambassador to the UK, Mr. Jaime Marcan Romero. His Excellency the Costa Rican Ambassador to the UK, Mr. Rafael Ortiz. His Excellency the British Ambassador to Ecuador, Mr. Chris Campbell. And also Her Deepness, Ms. Sylvia Earle. Before we start, some housekeeping. To one side of your screen, you'll hopefully see a chat box and a question box. For the Q&A section of this evening, please use the question box. And for any other comments or a general chat, please use the chat box. As many of you will know, we would normally be holding this event in person at the Royal Geographic Society in London. However, it's been an unusual year for all of us. And for GCT, whilst it's been disruptive, the team rapidly reshaped plans at the outset of the pandemic, and we managed to continue a wide range of activities throughout this year including supporting partners to get back into field for research as soon as it was safe. Thanks to support from our loyal donors and supporters, we continue to make progress and have impact across our priority areas. And during this challenging period, we've also managed to secure some exciting new grants for the coming months and years. On to tonight, where our focus is on the oceans and marine life of the Galapagos. Whether you're lucky enough to have been to Galapagos or have only seen it in pictures, you'll know that the marine life there is wondrous and awe-inspiring. From huge schools of scalloped hammerhead sharks to unique marine iguanas, the world found in the water surrounding the islands is like no other. GCT has been and is very active in two particular areas. Measures to protect the waters around the Galapagos for these marine species and seeking to rid the islands and its waters of plastic pollution. Those are the topics for tonight. I'm sure many of you saw over the summer, and it's been in the news again this week, the news of a large Chinese fishing fleet that descended upon the water surrounding the Galapagos Islands. The scale of these fleets and impact they have on the marine life has shocked us all. GCT has been supporting Jonathan Green and the Galapagos Whale Shark Project for a number of years. This team gathers evidence to understand the routes taken by these endangered sharks as they leave the protection of the Galapagos Marine Reserve and enter the high seas, where they're at serious risk from industrial fishing. They follow migration corridors such as the one between Galapagos and the Cocos Islands in Costa Rica. Research is vital to identify the key marine areas that need special protection. In fact, one of the first GCT supported research activities that was able to go ahead in August was a dive trip to track whale sharks and other marine species in the northern part of the archipelago, led by Jonathan Green, who will speak to us about this shortly. The Ecuadorian government is also responding to this threat and is now in the process of designing an ocean protection strategy for the region. Yolanda Kakabadzi, another of our guests, will tell us more about this. However, industrial fishing is not the only pressure the migrating megafauna of Galapagos face. Whether inside the Galapagos Marine Reserve, the GMR, or outside, plastic pollution is another major threat. And evidence is emerging that a large proportion of the plastic waste that washes up on the beaches of Galapagos is from these industrial fishing fleets. Through our plastic pollution free Galapagos program, we're gathering evidence to better understand the source of the plastic. And one innovative method we're using is called garbology, a modern day version of archaeology. We're delighted to be working with the University of York on this aspect of the program, which John Schofield will be telling us about. So thank you in advance to Jonathan, Yolanda and John for joining us tonight to share insights and thoughts on these topics. Our work is far from done, however, and so tonight I also wanted to mention that we are launching a new fund named the Fund for Hope to further our objective to make the waters around Galapagos a safer place for its inhabitants. My last task just now is to welcome GCT's president, Monty Halls, to the stage, and he will be your host for this evening's panel discussion. After serving as an ambassador of UCT for many years, Monty Halls became president of GCT in 2015. He's a TV presenter, a very well-known one uh, indeed, um, a marine biologist, an expedition leader, and a professional diver. He first visited the Galapagos Islands while filming for Channel 5's Great Ocean Adventures in 2005, and he's returned several times. 
Most recently, he took his family for two seasons of My Family in the Galapagos that you may have seen. Let me now pass the baton to Monty. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, yeah, my name is Monty and um, I'm president of the Galapagos Conservation Trust. And thank you so much for uh, joining us. And um, uh, it's wonderful to see a global audience, a true global audience. If there's one thing we know about the Galapagos, that it's a precious global jewel. And uh, wonderful to see that it ignites such passion from around the world. And that's symbolized tonight by the people we've got joining us from all around uh, the globe. So um, my uh, relationship with the islands uh, goes back 20 years or so, as Charmaine uh, was saying, but I was very fortunate over the last few years to take my family out and actually live in the community uh, on the islands. And uh, it, was, it was a fascinating, fascinating experience. So I think tonight uh, we're very fortunate to have three such knowledgeable uh, panelists to answer some of the questions that uh, I know you'll have uh, about the current state of the islands and the future of the islands as well. Um, now, there's uh, all sorts of things I need to just flag up for you. So I've got some notes with me to make sure I don't miss anything. The first one is questions. You'll have an opportunity to ask questions at any point during the discussion. Just um, feel free to type them in. And Claire from GCT is collating the questions. So there should be 20 minutes at the end to answer those questions. You'll also see a poll uh, thing, a poll tab, and that's a series of questions uh, related to the natural history and conservation of the islands as well. And um, we'll visit those polls in a minute and see how you've got on with those questions. Um, but um, without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce, we've got a surprise and a very special guest uh, joining us. And uh, when we were filming last year in the Galapagos, um, I was very lucky to meet Norman Rye in Floriana. And uh, Norman's official title is the Minister of the Governing Council of Galapagos, vital for ensuring that the islands are protected for future generations. But what really struck me about Norman was his passion, his eloquence, and his deep knowledge about the real issues that the islands face. Now, Norman has to catch a plane in about 10 minutes' time but um, he's uh, agreed to just come and say a few words about the work of the GCT and the conservation of the islands going forward. So uh, without further ado, I think we can welcome Norman to the stage. I just got to, uh, a text saying he's on in a moment. We're just inviting him on. Ready? <laughs> okay. Monty, thank you very much. The pleasure to see you again. And please uh, send a big hug to all the team of GCT. Uh, GCT for us is really a, a really important uh, ally of our work uh, in Galapagos through all these years. Great commitment and we support the work of GCT in Galapagos. and because they are really close to the people and close to the commitment for, for our natural heritage in the island. So for us, it's really, really an honor to be here again. Last year, I had the opportunity to be also in, in honor of Galapagos Day. And also, it's really important place to talk with all the people that are interested in Galapagos right now. I just want to say something really short. First of all, uh, Galapagos is a turning point. Uh, Galapagos is uh, feeling, suffering the, the, the consequences of the pandemic. And one of, one of them is the economic crisis that people is living right now in Galapagos because tourism stopped it around the world and stopped it in Galapagos too. And I believe that there are many threats against the natural heritage, climate change, uh, invasive species, but I think so that right now poverty could be another threat. So it's important to find a way to support people and to support nature at the same time. This is one of the strategic issues that Galapagos have to face 
for the next future in the year that is coming. It's important to note that also uh, the people from Galapagos has a great commitment with his natural heritage. In 2017, when this big Chinese vessel was founded inside the marine reserve, uh, they found uh, at least uh, 6,000 sharks inside of it. And when it happens, uh, the, the community of Galapagos get united and they send a big call to the authorities and to the world. We need more Galapagos. We need to increase our marine reserve and we need to increase the protection of, 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 of the Galapagos Islands and his resources. We need to increase the protection of life in the islands. This was the call of the people in 2017. Right now, the government of Ecuador is working and analyzing with, with, with the people of the civil society and also with NGOs and, and, and with expertise of science and other organizations around the world, the possibility to, to do and to take this big step, the way to analyze how to create a new marine protected area next to Galapagos in the zone, in economic exclusive zone, to see if, if, if it is possible based in scientific data and how to find the balance between the fishery national industrial fleet that right now is against this, this, this possibility of the, of the decision of, of the expansion of the marine reserve and how to find the balance with the protection of, the, of, of our oceans. In, in, the same, in, in that way, uh, Ecuador decided to get into the Global Ocean Alliance. The Global Ocean Alliance, as you know, is uh, there are many countries around the world, 30 countries, is uh, the, the leaders of this initiative is the UK government this moment. And the objective is to increase the protection of our oceans in a 30% at least before 2030. We are right now there because we know that that's an important decision and we need to work on it. But at the same time, we need to, to find a way to generate this uh, commitment of the planet with Galapagos because Ecuador has a strong commitment with Galapagos historically. But we need to find this connection because a place as Galapagos could be a really important uh, reference to all the world. So uh, the discussions and the turning point of Galapagos is, is, is a really key moment uh, that we have to learn together uh, all the, all the all, all the learnings that the pandemic is giving to us in relation of conservation of our islands, the conservation of the seas, and this uh, future that is plenty of challenges. So my invitation today is to work together with us, work with the people, uh, work with us, work the organizations around the world, and, but please think also in the people of Galapagos that are the first defenders of the natural heritage. Thank you very much for, for this time and thank you for GCT again for all this commitment and all this working together with us. I think that is the kind of alliances that we can uh, keep doing for the future and I hope that this can open great opportunities to keep doing great things for the people from Galapagos and for the natural heritage of the islands. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Norman. And safe travels. Um, uh, just to echo uh, what Norman uh, says there, um, it was very obvious uh, to me uh, over the last uh, sustained visits that I made to the islands over the last three years, just how prevalent GCT was, and uh, particularly in backing projects uh, in, in terms of conservation of sharks and uh, the plastics issue, which of course is a global issue, but particularly affects some island nations. So. It was very obvious how prevalent uh, GCT was in all of these uh, projects and how important that funding really was. So um, uh, moving forward, um, it was while we were there in the islands last year, I, I remember thinking that, you know, it's the word of the moment, isn't it? A circuit breaker. I remember thinking how wonderful it would be if the islands got a circuit breaker, just got a little rest. Uh, the environment there. And perhaps that was one of the side effects of the pandemic, I thought, that it acted as a little circuit breaker for the ecosystem there. But I think one of the questions we want to address tonight is 
does that mean that there are other more direct threats emerging? As Norman said, poverty within the islands, um, illegal fishing, poaching activities, illegal animal smuggling, um, environmental um, degradation uh, through programs being stopped. So that I think is a really important issue for us to have a little chat about tonight. So um, we'll just have a quick look at the polls. We'll see how you've got on in the polls. So here we go. Um, uh, the questions are, what's the name of the tag whale shark that went missing in May this year? Um, I don't know if we've got the results of the polls. Um, here we go. I don't think the results of the polls are in yet. So do you know what? I'll keep pushing on. And uh, more significantly, we'll introduce our panel, uh, I think. So, um, OK, um, we're really lucky to be joined by three people who have real experience with these islands and real expertise and real knowledge. So um, our, our panel is uh, Yolanda Kakabadze is part of the Ecuadorian government's commission to address the threat of large fishing fleets to the Galapagos Islands. And blimey, isn't that something that's been all over the news? You know, I've been contacted by people all over the world who've been horrified at, at what they're seeing. So it'd be lovely to find out the real story behind that. She was the Minister of Environment for Ecuador and served as NGO liaison officer for the United Nations Conference for Environment and Development, the Rio Earth Summit in 1992. She is also the former president of the World Conservation Union, um, IUCN, uh, from 96 to 2004, and former president of WWF International from 2010 to 2017. She was the first executive director of uh, uh, in uh, Ecuador of uh, the uh, Nature Foundation there. And in 1993, she founded um, the Future of Latin America um, a Nature Foundation as well. Um, she's a member of the board of several uh, national and international organizations of civil society and also in the private sector. We're also joined by Jonathan Green, for a long time been a hero of mine, Jonathan, is the founder and director of the Galapagos Whale Shark Project, which he set up in 2011 to monitor and study whale sharks in Galapagos, which GCT has supported for many, many years. He's worked for nearly three decades in the Galapagos Islands and had several thousand dives in the surrounding waters. He's an elected fellow of the Royal Geographical Society of London, and when not in the Galapagos, works on expedition vessels in the polar regions. He also teaches photography workshops in destinations around the world and has won several international awards. Um, and finally, we're joined by John Schofield, who's a professor of archaeology at the University of York, where he specializes in cultural heritage management and contemporary archaeology. In 2018, he was part of the Science to Solutions workshop in the Galapagos, organized by GCT, where he introduced an idea that archeological methods and perspectives could helpfully enhance the various approaches being used globally to address marine plastic pollution. John has been working in contemporary archeology span for 25 years, meaning he's now studying things that didn't exist when he started. Um, so um, without further ado, panel, welcome to the, the stage. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank and you. I think the first question to, to Jonathan, uh, if we may, um, I think you've got some footage for us, Jonathan, that just typifies the, the work you're doing from your recent expedition there in August. We do indeed. Um, yes, this is where you sort of hope that technology will, will actually come through. So here we have, for me, it's, it's an amazing moment. I think anyone who's experienced this, whale sharks, despite their enormous size, can literally appear out of nowhere. It's, it's, they, they just materialize, as you mentioned a moment ago. Here we have a researcher who's going down onto the left side to take a photograph, a photo ID. I'm hanging in the water, and if you watch the eye of the whale shark, it follows my, my, myself in the water. So whale sharks are very, very curious animals. They're gentle giants. This is a, a medium-sized individual somewhere between perhaps 11 and 13 meters in length, weighing 20, 25 tons in weight. But you can see how, how docile, how, how tranquil they are in the water. And this is actually placing one of the satellite tags. This is part of the investigation that we've been carrying out now for a, a period of 10 years. Uh, this is not particularly a, an invasive method. It's simply like a closed peg that you place on the dorsal fin itself. And this being a satellite transmitter, when the animal comes to the surface, transmit its position and hopefully de details and data about the depth and the uh, diving behavior. The animal continues on its way, unaware that it's been uh, tagged 
with a satellite tag. And in fact, it's very curious. So it simply turns around to see the, uh, the divers in the water. And this is one of the tracks that we got. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this track in just a moment. A historic track that goes all the way from Darwin Island up to Cocos Island. And this could not have come with better timing. So uh, that's just a little bit of the background of the work that, uh, that we've been doing now. Uh, thanks to the support, of course, of GCT, uh, working alongside the Galapagos National Park uh, for the last decade now. Um, thank you so much, Jonathan. But, um, it's wonderful to see that. That's real science in action, isn't it? You know, with a, with a truly majestic animal. That, yeah. But it's, it's quite a special encounter in this part of the world for a number of reasons, That not it? It's not just an encounter with a big animal that you're tagging. There's a much bigger story here, isn't it? Yes, I mean, years ago when we first started diving or, or more um, commercial diving, if you like, in the Galapagos Islands, we really were not aware of uh, the, the level of diversity. I mean, everyone, everyone is aware of how unique the Galapagos Islands are, but how diverse and how abundant the, the life is, particularly in the marine environment. So this was a, uh, perhaps something that wasn't always stressed uh, historically. Uh, so when we first encountered whale sharks, we weren't really sure what size the population was. Um, one of the first surprising pieces of data that came out was the fact that we have 99% of them are adult females. And they appear to be in an advanced stage of pregnancy because they give birth to live pups. So the, the mystery that surrounds these animals, very, very docile, completely inoffensive. They're filter feeders, uh, huge animals, and they've been around uh, planet Earth probably for... Uh, 70, possibly up to 80 million years. So these are in fact dinosaurs from a bygone era that still roam the earth today. Um, I trained originally as a geologist, of course, fascinated with dinosaurs growing up. And so for me, this was a unique opportunity coming face to face with a, with a living dinosaur. So the Galapagos continues to surprise us with its diversity and the abundance of life. And when I was asked just recently, what is the importance of the Galapagos Islands in terms of the marine uh, ecosystem? Well, the conditions there are absolutely unique. Warm waters flooding down from the, the north, cold waters flooding up from the south. The position of the island and the, the existence of the geological platform means that you get an upwelling of these very, very nutritionally rich waters. And when they, when they get together with the, the warm waters and the cold waters, then create this explosion of life. So if you like, uh, just very briefly, Galapagos, is the cradle of life. It's the foundation of all life in the eastern tropical Pacific. So that is why it is so important. The work that we've been doing with the war sharks just goes to show how far these uh, many of these species travel. So a lot of the marine megafauna don't remain within the protected waters of the Galapagos Marine Reserve, but they will travel enormous distances. In the case of the whale sharks, possibly all the way across the oceans and around the globe. But the case of this particular one that we tagged that you just saw a moment ago, and the track, track I believe you can still see on your screens, showed very demonstratively uh, how animals are traveling directly from Galapagos. And in this case, it traveled up to Cocos Island um, of Costa Rica. And at this moment, there is a, a proposal which has been agreed upon uh, from both governments. And I understand the ambassadors, uh, both governments, Costa Rica and Ecuador, um, are, are present with us tonight, this evening, um, an agreement that would create a protected swimway between Cocos Island and the Galapagos. But what we need is data that shows why it is that we need to protect these areas, how the animals are traveling through these areas, how they're using these habitats, and why it is that we need at this moment so desperately uh, to increase the levels of protection. Thank you so much, John. And, um... Uh, you paint a very vivid picture of just how important these islands are, of course. And, you know, mm -hmm. it's fairly widely acknowledged this is the last citadel of the shark, you know, one of the last bastions of the shark um, globally, really. And Yolanda, if I, could, if I could turn to you directly, really, to address that question with, with the sharks in the islands. We've all seen the images uh, from, uh, from the islands that show the fleets massing uh, at the edge of the islands. Just how significant is that, Yolanda? How much of a threat does that place uh, to those populations? Um, microphone, I think, Yolanda. Sorry, Yolanda, can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> there I am. I, I was just thanking GCT for uh, inviting me to be part of this uh, discussion. 
especially because it is about the Galapagos, it, 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 something that is very, a place that is very close to my heart. Uh, and, and your question, the, the direct answer, Monty, is this is a terrible threat. Um, it is totally unsustainable to have 350 large uh, ships next to the, to the marine reserve and to the economic zone. And basically because we all know that um, all the species in this marine treasure are migrating, are moving around all the time. So um, to have this large fleet in this very narrow corridor between the two economic zones, the economic zone of the continent and the one of Galapagos is, is a terrible threat. And, and the other fact is that uh, we don't know what sort of fishing gear is being used, um, wh whether they are fishing what they say or something else. Uh, why do they turn off their equipment, their, their satellite uh, systems so that we don't know certain um, hours of the day and the night what they are, they are doing and, and what they are fishing. So all that is, is a threat to which I, I want to build a parallel of, uh, of the land resources when they have been abused, they, they become a desert. So desertification of the sea is, is also um, possible and it's going to happen unless we have something, um, some sort of solution, which I think Monty is not fighting with China, but inviting China to be a partner of the conservation of the Galapagos. And, and I see there that there is a lot of potential, especially because China is going to be um, the host of the next uh, biodiversity convention, large, important meeting. So my, my um, struggle at this moment is identifying the people in the arguments to have China become a partner of Ecuador and um, join us in the protection of the Galapagos and all the species. And that means withdrawing from that corridor that is, that is so important uh, for the Galapagos future. Um, thank you, Lando. And um, I, I very much agree, by the way, I think uh, that discussion and um, you know, reaching mutual agreements as opposed to conflict, head-to-head -head conflict has shown historically it's, it just doesn't work, does it? But yeah. Yolanda and, and perhaps Jonathan, I've heard when we were out there that um, a lot of the local fishermen said to me that although the fleets are actually outside the exclusion zone, they're sending in small boats that don't show up on radar, that a lot of them actually act almost as factory ships to process yeah. the sharks that are being brought back. Is that is that true would you say it is uh, it yeah is. absolutely sorry <laughs> you go ahead yeah both of us jonathan and i know that that is true it's not it's not only the large fleet uh, ships of this fleet but the smaller ones and uh, i'm afraid sometimes those smaller ones are ecuadorian ones yeah there are, there are various techniques and various problems that, that we have to face here one is that yes the, the chinese are not perhaps alone as Yolanda just says that they do have local uh, logistical support and unfortunately uh, there are fishermen that are assisting by uh, catching sharks in the, these protected waters. Um, they are also using a technique known as a, a fad, a fishing attraction uh, device. So you can set it on one side, uh, technically outside the marine reserve and using the westerly currents allow it to drift through the reserve itself and as it drifts through, it catches and attracts uh, species such as manta rays, turtles, sharks, uh, the, the target fish as well, perhaps. And as those drift through and out of the reserve, you could say technically that, that vessel is not fishing inside the Galapagos Marine Reserve, but they're using a technique that means that they are illegal fishing very, very actively within protected waters. Yeah. Um, and at this juncture, if I can bring John in, because there's another hidden impact of those fleets. And uh, when we were out there again last year and, and a few years ago, we were struck by the plastic. We were struck by the influx of, of plastic coming in. And I understand, John, a fair amount of that plastic, 
a large proportion actually comes from the fishing fleets as well. So it's like a double whammy really hitting the islands. It, it, it is exactly so. I mean, it's a, it's a massive problem globally. I think we all, we all know that and, and um, we'll, we'll all be very familiar with the, with the statistics for both for, for global plastic pollution, but also local plastic pollution within Galapagos. Uh, the figure I saw the other day, which really struck home with me was the fact that there's over 5 trillion plastic items floating in the world's oceans. And that's not to mention what's actually beneath the surface and what's in marine sediments and what's on the beaches and so forth. So it is a, it is a huge, a huge problem. Um, but I suppose, I mean, I, I guess it's partly the reason why I was invited on onto the panel tonight. I, I do come at this from a slightly different angle. And when you read in scientific literature about these, um, about plastic pollution, the terms waste, pollution, litter, debris, plastic, garbage, all of those words uh, are commonly used. But I'm an archaeologist, so, so I, I recognize all of those labels, but I also see these five trillion items as artifacts. And as artifacts, and as an archaeologist, I see potential in, in the understanding that we can, um, we can gain from, from investigating those objects in a little bit more detail. So on the, on the negative side, if you like, this is a vast toxic um, assemblage that's floating around the world's oceans. But, but you can also look at it as a resource that we can actually learn a lot from. So I've been involved since 2018 now at the invitation of GCT to do some archaeological work on these materials. In, and in 2018, we, have, we ran some workshops uh, in Galapagos with members of the local community and also members of the um, uh, scientific community as well, in which we developed some techniques for workshopping some of these artifacts, if you like, looking at them in detail and trying to find out um, more about them, both where they originally came from, so their, their long-term history, if you like, their long biography, uh, from the point at which they were manufactured, um, but also their more recent history and trying to get at the behaviours which caused them to be in the sea in the first place. So that's where we come to your, your direct question. Um, and by doing this work and looking at the objects, uh, one, of the, one of the things we looked at, for example, was, was how long it's been floating around in the ocean for. Um, and by looking at that and recognising that a lot of this material washing up in Galapagos is very fresh, it's clearly not come very far. The fact that a lot of this material is, has Chinese labeling on it um, suggests China as a point of origin, but it can't have come from China. It can't, hasn't been in the ocean that long, for one thing. And collaborating with some of the, um, the team at Utrecht, oceanographers at Utrecht, they've demonstrated that the currents wouldn't carry stuff from China to Galapagos anyway. So it's definitely not coming from mainland China. So the source is Chinese and it has to be close to Galapagos. And just to give you the, the, the tentative results of this analysis so far, less than 10% of Galapagos plastic is actually coming from Galapagos. Um, about 60% of it is coming from mainland South America, in particular southern Ecuador and northern Peru, where the currents hit the coastline and then turn east and come through Galapagos. Um, and more than 30% of it is coming from Chinese sources. And the assumption is that it's coming from the, um, from the Chinese fleet. Uh, thank you very much, John. And um, I understand a few people can't hear me, by the way. I don't think ever in my speaking career have I been told to speak up, but I will speak up now. I'll, I'll bellow a bit. But um, to, to turn the, the discussion um, back to the whale sharks, it's a very symbolic uh, animal, an iconic animal um, in the islands. And I understand uh, Yolanda and, and Jonathan D. John that um, the threats from the fishing fleets are something like a whale shark. The fishing fleets, I, I'm guessing, tend to use long lines, baited hooks. You'd think there wouldn't be a, a threat there, but there is a threat, uh, isn't there? And I understand quite an iconic animal has gone missing fairly re uh, recently. Yes, um, they represent a threat to many, many different species, obviously. Uh, you, the, the fleets, I, we hear this term a lot, the, the Chinese fleet. This is actually a very amorphous fleet. So there are tens of thousands of vessels, which might be freezer vessels, tankers that resupply them. Uh, these are all almost completely autonomous, so they can move around the world and don't, go have back to, uh, don't have to go back to port to offload. Uh, so this means they can continue fishing uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You get the picture. 
What we have out there is a fleet of vessels which is comprised of squid uh, jiggers, which were fishing, fishing for Humboldt squid, for example, off the south of the economic zone. But also on the, uh, the south and western areas, you have uh, per seine trawlers, netters of different sizes, and of course, longline vessels, which is one of the most destructive forms of fishing which exists on the planet today, because it's completely non-selective. Um, so yes, they represent a very, very real threat, not just to whale sharks, but to all shark species, all megamarine fauna. And the fishing, as Yolanda says, is simply not sustainable. This is the reaping of the oceans, not to use a, uh, another term. So um, recently, unfortunately, we lost the transmission of a, a fairly small whale shark. Um, Hope was her name, ironically enough. Uh, she'd been given that name, she'd been adopted. She appeared to be making a loop and returning to the Galapagos, and our hope was that she would demonstrate a migratory circuit, and, and that would be historic data for us. Uh, but we lost her transmission on the 22nd of May of this year. We tagged to September last year, and her last transmissions indicated that the speed of the tag was traveling at between six and eight knots. The maximum speed of a whale shark is probably around about three knots. They usually travel between 1.5 and two. So we don't think that this could have come from an animal that was simply swimming. It wouldn't happen that way. It could be a satellite error, but all of her track previous to that, over uh, 5,000 uh, kilometers and a period of some uh, um, 150 days, uh, unfortunately didn't show anything like that at these kind of anomalies. So we believe, and when we looked closer at the fishing activity, those days when she stopped transmitting, it was an area of absolutely massive, very, very intensive uh, fishing activities. And these are netters, these are longliners, these are all sorts of different vessels. So there is a high probability. And when we looked at historical data over the last decade, we realized this was the third such animal, uh, also all juveniles, which can easily be picked out of the water, that disappeared in the same area. So yes, there's a real threat. And we believe that this is a silent slaughter which goes on uh, out of sight, out of bind in these international waters which are completely unregulated. Yolanda, may I ask you um, directly? Thank you, Jonathan. Um, but um, Yolanda, is it a case, you say it's a case of engaging with the Chinese and, and trying to figure out a way forward, a sustainable way forward. Is an important part of that uh, the work of people like John, the work of people like Jonathan to amass data that is unequivocal, that says these are corridors that are being used by these animals. This is the direct impact of the plastic that's in hitting the islands. That data surely gives power to the arguments to say this has to stop. Absolutely, Monty. Uh, if I'm not a scientist. I'm not a scientist. I'm a, a policy maker and I love public policy, but you cannot take decisions on public policy unless it is based on science, on data, on information. So it is absolutely essential that we gather information. And uh, this commission that you mentioned before, created by the president between government and civil society actors, is um, a talking to different scientists who know and are doing research in the Galapagos in order to compile the necessary information to make a proposal and a, a proposal that we hope would be backed by all sectors and we have to take into consideration the fishing sector of uh, of ecuador and tuna fishing mainly the small fisher, uh, fishermen of the galapagos and of the continent the conservation community of ecuador and, and global uh, and any other sector in um, in ecuador that has a stake in the Galapagos, so that when we come with a proposal that initially will be a, a, an Ecuadorian proposal to, to conserve a larger area, maybe, and definitely an area that goes into the Cocos Islands, and later on have that decision be a, a, an Ecuadorian and Costa Rican decision, that would be the best way that we can take a first step it doesn't mean that we'll be the last. We have to continue searching for uh, answers and solutions that would guarantee that the Calabagos Marine Reserve is, uh, is fully, uh, fully effective. Uh, so that, that is the work that we are doing now in talking to all kinds of uh, stakeholders. 
Yes, I think um, for any argument like that to be presented, you have to have a solid foundation for that argument, don't you? And I think a lot of the work John and Jonathan are doing and many other agencies as well are, are providing that data, which is the start point for your discussion, isn't it? It has to be. Absolutely. It has to be. That yeah. is right. Um, well, for, the, um, uh, for everyone who, who's tuned in, um, the GCT has, is very much focused on, on this issue at the moment and has, has launched a fund called the Fund for Hope. And the idea of that is to raise £100,000 a year to support the work that's being done to try and find out more information about these corridors and the roots of the animals and also to gather data on the sources of plastic as well. So tonight is really announcing that project. It's called the Fund for Hope. And the idea is to create those crucial funds to make sure that this work continues. It's so, so important to gather this data, uh, to make some of the arguments unequivocal and put yourself in an unassailable position. Uh, I think when you have these uh, discussions to say, this is an issue and here is the proof. And it's the work of Jonathan and John and their ilk that's making that happen, really. So, um, OK, we um, uh, I've got another question for John here. Um, John, uh, Jonathan has talked about what can be done to eliminate the direct threat from the fishing fleets. But what can be done by policymakers and more significantly by us as individuals? It's a question I get asked all the time. And I feel the frustration is what can I do as an individual? To, it, to make a, a, an impact on this and to decrease the threat of the, of the plastics? Yes, I'll, I'll come to that second. The first thing I wanted to say was, I mean, we've been talking a lot about China here quite, quite rightly. And, um, and one of the things that just strikes me is that the fact that um, Galapagos is a, is a World Heritage Site, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, um, being impacted by um, plastic pollution that is originating indirectly from China. And I just wonder whether one of the helpful conversations that could be had here is through UNESCO. Um, China is a, is a significant player within UNESCO. China has many World Heritage Sites of its own. And I think a conversation at that level, um, which can be quite political as well, uh, I think could, could be one of many um, productive uh, lines that could be could be pursued. So that was just that was just an, ob an observation, really. In terms of what people can do as individuals, well, there's the obvious re response to that about about responsibly using plastic and and, and recycling and all those kind of things. Um, uh, and and of, of course, we, we all I'm sure do that already. Um, but the other thing I think we can do is um, get involved in initiatives like the one that's being launched tonight by the Galapagos Conservation Trust, which is, um, and, and it's been described by, as the world's first marine garbology online expedition. Um, and I think, I think there's going to be a link um, shared in a minute about, about this. This is a, a project that, that stems from the work that um, we did in Galapagos in 2018. Um, and it's a realization, I think, that we spent a lot of lot of time in 2018 looking at eight items, plastic items that had washed up on the beaches of Galapagos. Um, and we looked at them in great detail, and we realized that there was a lot more we could have done if we'd had more, even more time. Archaeology is time consuming, even when you're looking at a plastic bottle. Um, so one of the things we we wondered was whether we could actually put this out as a citizen science project and get other people to do the work for us essentially um, and we trialed this with the Australian Museum uh, in 2018 2019 uh, and uh, tweaked a few of the of the of the problems that we had with that um, and looked at the method in a little more detail and tonight uh, it's going live as a, an opportunity for members of GCT to um, to be involved in this project so when you when you go online and you 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 um, uh, you volunteer for this expedition, not a real expedition, obviously, you'll be at your at your kitchen table or whatever, um, and you'll be given an object um, which you can look at. And there's several photographs of that object and you can zoom in and zoom out. And what we'd like you to do is to research that object and tell us what you think about its, its biography, its story. Um, and that will then contribute and feed into our uh, research. 
Um, I think it's a wonderful thing, John, because as I said, I think the one thing particularly young people want to do, um, obviously they want to join a conservation group, they want to get involved, but they want to get hands on. They want to do something. And I think we all feel the same. You know, they want to interact in a positive way. And one of the things we noticed when we were out in the islands last time were a lot of citizen science projects. There was an excellent shark ID device that divers could use out there, which all contributes to the data. And I think initiatives like this are, are, are very significant, very important. So, um, uh, Yolanda, a quick uh, question for you, if I may. Uh, Jonathan and John have talked about what should and can be done to protect Galapagos marine life from the fishing fleets. You've been invited by the president to be part of a commission to address the threat of large fishing fleets threatening the Galapagos. What is the commission proposing to do about these fleets? Monty, there are several fronts for us to work on. It's, uh, it's collecting data, as I mentioned before, from uh, scientists um, in the Galapagos and outside of the Galapagos. It is talking to Costa Rica to see how soon we could come up with a decision of both countries to create this corridor, this conservation corridor. It is uh, um, it, talking to China, to different actors in China in order to prepare the ground for a negotiation. I'm a, I'm a conflict manager, so I believe a lot in the potential of um, going through dialogue, reaching an, an agreement. There is also the importance of uh, talking to the neighboring countries, Colombia, Peru, Chile. All of us need to approach this threat with a common, um, with a common action. None of us on our own will be able to succeed. And, the, I, and I think that the best way to succeed in any way with any of our proposals of respecting more the marine life of uh, reaching the target of uh, conservation of 30% of the oceans um, by 2030, all that has to be done uh, together in, in the groupings of the different countries. But also we need to we need to bring back in or make it stronger this discussion about what do we fish, when do we fish, and how do we fish. And I think, I think those what, when, and how have been lost a bit in the last years. And, and today that we are suffering from a coronavirus, um, we have forgotten about uh, the control of what we used to control 10 months ago. And, and one of those areas is the oceans, international waters that at this moment, I think, are even more threatened than before. So um, uh, building back um, the, the sense of community between all our countries is important. And I just the last point, uh, Monty, I think that is absolutely important is to see how many individuals and organizations like GCT have come up to Ecuador saying, I want to join, I want to support and uh, count on me. You can't imagine the number of professionals and non-professionals from all over the world. And, and John, uh, one of, um, a couple of those is uh, experts in international UNESCO um, uh, uh, convention that have given me so much food for thought. For example, uh, do we have a, a, a zone around the protected area that is protected as well, that is respected as well? And, and that is not. A, a buffer zone has not been built for the Galapagos, and I think that's an area to explore. Buffer zones for marine areas. So. I, I'm so thankful for having this enormous community of volunteers coming to Ecuadorians, um, members of, the, of this commission, through all means and saying, count on me, I want to support you. And that is a, an enormous sense of uh, gratitude to the world conservation community. Thank you, uh, Yolanda. And um, it, it does raise a very interesting point there. Um, 
And se I've noticed several of the comments scrolling away. And this is really, we're now into questions for the whole panel. But one of the questions that has come up is that we're painting uh, this picture as a very binary one with one villain. And the villain's China. And that's it, simple. And I'm sure it's way more Absolutely. complex than that's that. Right. Is, is that a fair reflection? There's actually many players and many factors involved here. Can I, can I just, oh, Jonathan's muted. I was just going to say that just, just to remind people of the, of the data from the archeological work really where 30% of it is, 30% of the plastic is of Chinese origin. Um, there is a little bit that's local um, from the islands, but 60% um, but of it is, is coming from mainland South America. So there is, a, there is an issue to be addressed there and there is work to be done, I think, with the, uh, particularly with the coastal communities. Um, in, yeah. um, in Peru and Ecuador. Uh, Jonathan, sorry, you were saying something, yeah. You're um, muted. Still, still can't hear You're you, muted, Jonathan. Jonathan. Sorry, it's what, what happens when you, you're too focused on, on the subject. So, uh, totally, totally agreed. We are pointing the finger at one particular nation. Uh, I think certainly right now the unregulated fishing um, of the Chinese fleet is probably the largest of any nation on the planet. So I think that the finger does need to be pointed in that direction, but absolutely right. This is not one nation. There are many, many nations that are involved in unregulated um, or illegal fishing practices because the artifacts that they're using are illegal, the areas that they're fishing in are protected, et cetera, et cetera. And this, this is a worldwide problem. So I think I agree also there with Yolanda that uh, first of all, we need discussion on an international level uh, to see how we address this. And it needs to be done urgently because we can't keep postponing this. We need to create awareness. And I've seen some comments coming in through uh, the, the chat that people are saying, wow, I had no idea of these problems and why isn't somebody doing something about it? Well, who is that somebody? So the high seas are basically unregulated. They're a lawless area and we do need international cooperation. So UNESCO, United Nations, whatever is the entity. So nations need to come together so that we, we begin to regulate uh, this kind of fishing and we have to have independent observers, international observers present on those vessels. So there has to be accountability, accountability in the terms of the species that they're taking, the, um, the type of uh, artifacts that they're using for fishing, quotas, and when they're landed, it needs to be recorded so we know what is being fished, where and how. And those protected species need to be completely off limits. So, so many of the species that you mentioned before, uh, Monty, on the vessel that was captured in 2017 in the Galapagos Marine Reserve, um, the, the uh, Fuyuan Leng uh, 999 was captured with, uh, I think it was 7,200 sharks, many of which were critically endangered, such as the, the, the hammerheads, for example. So we need to be, um, we need to have a, a very, very clear control on the international and high seas what is being fished, where it's being fished, when it's being fished, and where the markets are when it's being landed. And until we have that, then quite simply, the oceans have no future. Uh, and Yolanda, thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, Yolanda, may I ask that um, the exclusion zone at present around the Galapagos, I understand is about 300,000 square kilometers, it's quite large. I, I don't know if that's absolutely correct, Jonathan, You're, um, Yolanda, you'll be able to tell me, but um, one of the issues is surely that we can set up a wider exclusion zone, but it's policing that huge area. Is that a realistic prospect going forward, practically running the reserve? Uh, there is no capacity to control such an enormous area. And, and one of the initiatives that we are discussing at the moment is the creation of a fund initiated by Ecuador with Ecuadorian bonds but a, a large one, $30 million to start with and get matching fund for that in order to dedicate exclusively to control activities. And, and that is a must because it doesn't matter with the lines in the map are, are meaningless unless we have the capacity to, to control the area. So cross your fingers, you, Monty, and everybody that we can achieve this um, as soon as possible. 
But of course, you always think that control is the last resource. It should be a partnership from all over um, our nations to, to control these jewels in the crown. They are too important for the future of, uh, of the life in the ocean. Uh, to to be threatened in this way. So uh, let's see if we can achieve this. Um, I, I think that very wise words, Yolanda, and it's lovely looking at the comments going up the side of the screen. And there's one great comment that's resonated with me, and it simply said, never give up. That's Someone right. said it on the side of the screen. <laughs> yeah. the, what a wonderful thing to say, because it can be a bit yeah. overwhelming, all this, can't it? I think the pandemic... You know, the, the size of the problem, climate change, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, unequivocally, we are the generations who are the custodian of these islands, aren't we? To pass them on to the next generation. Do we want to be Absolutely. that generation that people look back on and say, how could they have let it happen? And I think that thing of just saying never give up, it was lovely to see it shoot up the side of the screen there. So um, a, a, yeah. question, a question for you, John, that's just come in. Is, well, there's two questions. One, with COVID, um, has a lot more plastic related to COVID appeared? Things like face masks, certainly an issue we're facing here in the UK. And also someone's asked, what's the most common item that is found in the Galapagos in terms of plastic pollution? OK, on the first one, I, I can't answer that question for Galapagos because I haven't been there obviously since March. Um, but everywhere else, it seems to be an emerging problem. Yes, and there was there. I've seen some news uh, news reports of remote beaches where a lot of face masks have been have been washing up. Um, and and I think just walking around our neighbourhoods, wherever we are in the world, we see discarded face masks and, to a lesser extent, uh, gloves and other pieces of COVID-related single-use plastic, um, which are just lying around. And of course, we all know where they, or well, lots of them, end up. So, of course, inevitably, it's going to be an, an, another, another challenge. Um, but I suppose, again, just taking a slightly different view of that, from an archaeological point of view, that's, that's quite interesting in a way, because it's, a, it's, it's, it's um, an episode of plastic deposition that has a particular start date. So we can actually use this to, to monitor or to measure the uh, speed of accumulation, if you like. How, how fast is it becoming a problem for something for which... We have a release date almost. Um, so that was the that was the first thing, and I can't remember what the second question was. <laughs> uh, the second question was, um, what's the item you're finding oh, most yeah. of? Yes, I, th uh, I think um, I think that has to be plastic bottles. I mean, they're 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 really very common indeed, um, but they're also really interesting because they a plastic bottle tells us an awful lot. We can we can tell, particularly if the labelling uh, survives, which it, which it often does. Not if it's been in the ocean for a very long time, obviously. But but a lot of them they do have some trace of the labelling still present within the within the the item. Um, so with that labelling, you can and the internet, uh, you can learn an awful lot about where it's come from, um, and often how long it's been around as well. Sell by dates, use by dates, and things like that. Wonderful, thank you. And um, a couple of other questions. Uh, well, there's loads of questions uh, coming in. Um, is uh, the impact, this, again, this is for the whole panel, is the impact of climate change manifesting itself on the islands? And there's a, a, an additional part of the question saying, uh, is marine life moving around, moving further offshore? Is it like a mini El Nino that's happening because of climate change? Are, are you noticing any changes? Well, that's, that's a complex question. I don't know. It's, it's certainly not my area of expertise. Um, I'm, uh, as I say, originally trained as a geologist, uh, but I would say that it would be highly unlikely that climate change is not affecting the islands. And what it would uh, certainly affect is the, uh, are the marine currents, their presence in the Galapagos, and whether or not we're going to have the same season or seasonality that we had before. So a very clear cool season, a very clear warm season, um, how the equatorial front is moving north and south. Uh, so all of those factors are going to be affected, and that will affect directly uh, the, the species which uh, live 
or frequent these waters. So yes, they're having an effect. I think one of the problems is that we haven't been studying it long enough and we don't have a data set that would indicate in a very short period what the effects are yet of climate change. But can we expect them? Yes. Again, thank you very much. And um, uh, the panel, we're, we're coming to the end of our, our time now. Uh, Sharon has very generously allowed us another 10 minutes to chat. Um, but I would say to everyone who's asking questions, GCT will produce a frequently asked question sheet at the end of this, which everyone will get sent, which hopefully covers the vast majority of questions being asked. But I'd just like you to, uh, if you can, just make a, a sort of final statement about what you see for the future of the islands, what can be done related to the issues we've discussed, and what the future holds for the Galapagos. So if we can start with yourself, Yolanda. Your question, uh, Monty, what's the future of the Galapagos and what Galapagos holds for us? Galapagos is a, a, is a lab. It's a laboratory of the planet, not only of Ecuador. And whatever happens in, in the Galapagos will be a clear indicator of what can we expect in other, in other parts of, uh, of the ocean. But also, let's not think only of species. Let's think about the relationship between humans and the species. Um, and, and I think this is the right moment to, to think about that now that we are living in, in the COVID era, where you see a direct relationship of the health of the planet with the health of humanity. So whatever is happening with humans in terms of not caring for um, nature and not, not investing in the conservation and, and the rational use of the resources is, it has an impact directly on, on humans, on, on our health and our future. So uh, working with the Galapagos uh, human community is as important because they are the the, the strongest and more important allies of uh, the na nature in the, in the islands. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Yolanda. And um, John, any thoughts from you? Yeah, I think I'd, 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 I'd agree with the, the point about the, um, uh, the, the Galapagos as a, as, a, as a laboratory. And I think that's part of the thinking behind the work that we've been doing on the on the contemporary archaeology or garbology as some people like to call it of the um, uh, of the of the islands um, really taking a, a very conventional um, branch of science in archaeology and um, and giving it an, a, a, a renewed relevance and a new lease of life almost by applying it to to a, a particular challenge in the in the contemporary world um, so I'm very I'm very excited by that possibility and and Galapagos being at the forefront of that of that development I suppose the other thing I'd say is that it's a it's a it's a crucial opportunity for um, or a good opportunity to, to address a crucial problem through collaboration and partnership um, and I think um, I think communication particularly with um, not only with the Chinese but with other governments um, and NGOs and organizations who um, who have a, a stake in Galapagos or who's, who's, um, for whom Galapagos is relevant. Those, those countries up the coast of South America, for example, from which plastic is coming to Galapagos. Um, better communications with some of those countries as well. Um, so I see, I see opportunity, I tend to see opportunities rather than <laughs> difficulties. So I would, I would like very much to see some developments in those, in those areas. Wonderful. What a lovely expression. Words to live by. Opportunities. Yeah. Uh, you know, not, not, not problems, basically. So, and Jonathan, yourself? Yes, I uh, absolutely agreed with, with both my fellow panelists. Uh, the future of Galapagos is no longer a local issue. If this pandemic has shown us something, it's that the, the actions uh, or activities of one nation affects us as a, as, a, as a globe, as a planet. We're now a, a single nation that inhabits this planet. So we have to look at the solutions as global, not as individual nations. What is really heartwarming is to look at the, the, the chat and see where everybody is, literally from around the world, 
there is an enormous amount of, of care, of concern, uh, and a desire to do something. So I think the awareness that exists gives us the tool to move forward. We know what the problem is, now we have to address those problems and we have to do it urgently. It is not gloom and doom. So everybody says, oh, this is it, this is the end of the world. The, the planet has survived massive extinctions, asteroids slamming into it. We can redress these problems, these issues that we have, but we should do it urgently. We cannot just sit back and watch what other nations are doing. All of us, individuals and nations, need to act together. There is a future, and you can be assured that we will never give up. That's wonderful. Thank you so much uh, to the panel. It's been brilliant talking. Brian, we could have talked to you for, for hours and hours. <laughs> but um, I, Can I just echo one sentiment you've all made? When I was out on the islands last year, if I'd said to any of the guides that we work with, Pablo, you know, uh, Robbie, all these fantastically enthusiastic guides, if I'd said to the young people living on the islands, the local community, if I'd said to my own daughter, eight years old, oh, there's no hope, you should give up. They would have been incandescent with rage. Mm -hmm. They were like, no, we are going to sort this out. And that was a one, I left the islands buoyed up because of the confidence and the motivation of, of those types of people. So it, it was wonderful. And it's wonderful to be involved in, in backing those efforts, isn't it, through, through GCT. So thank you so much for your, for your contribution tonight. Now, there's a last couple of things we need to do. We've got five minutes left. One is the polls, because everyone I know will be super keen to know how they got on. Uh, well, the name of the tagged whale shark, give yourself a pat on the back if you said hope. Um, how many shark species are found in Galapagos? It's 34. Jonathan, correct me if I'm wrong, 34. What percentage of plastic pollution found in Galapagos is thought to come from fishing activities? That's 30%. Is that right, John? And uh, how many sharks are killed globally each year? Yeah, that's a horrendous number, 100 million. Just about everyone you ever tell that are, are flabbergasted by that, that extraordinary figure. And, um, just a couple of uh, little housekeeping things going forward. It's been wonderful to have a global community join us tonight. And there's many other events that GCT going for, uh, do going forward. So please do stay engaged with, with GCT and the work they're doing. And, one of the ones coming up, and this is a shameless plug, is I'm going to talk soon about the filming of my family in the Galapagos. What happens when you two take two redhead toddlers to the Galapagos for three months? So uh, <laughs> that will be the story of, of that. But there's many other events that, that GCT do. And by popular demand as well, we've been asked to show that whale shark footage again, just to see us out. Is there a better way for us to finish this tour when looking at this beautiful animal and the important work that GCT, people like Jonathan are doing with it. Well, if you haven't had the opportunity, I would certainly urge you to try go and go diving and uh, witness what is surely one of the, the, the greatest uh, events in our oceans. All of this, these mega fauna uh, animals, uh, but diving, going into that world it's the equivalent of going into outer space. We don't all get that opportunity, but everybody can go diving or snorkeling. So head out. And what you're really helping also is the, the long-term conservation of these areas. Uh, without tourism to these remote wilderness areas, there's no local patrolling and there really is no protection. So head out there. It's an amazing world. I was going to say, Jonathan, it needs a bit of music, but then again, it doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> uh, why gild the lily? Why gild the lily? Well, thank you so much, everyone. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. And stay thank safe. You. And we'll see you at the next event. Thanks so much. <laughs> thanks to you. <laughs> Lovely to be with you. Ciao. Thank you.